I would like to give you a very well welcome. Sorry, a very warm welcome to a new round of the talk series on climate change organized by Scientist Rebellion. This is the first talk after our April actions. I am Renata, I'm a biologist and part of Scientist Rebellion Panama, which is part of the Latin American network or Avia Yala. We are scientists and academics who believe we should expose the severity and urgency of the climate and ecological emergency by engaging in nonviolent civil disobedience. Um, we have a profound understanding of the situation and unless we lead with an emergency response, we cannot expect others to do so. Some believe that we are alarmist and that is detrimental, but we are confronted with an alarming situation and believe it is vital for the public at large to understand what is at stake. Uh, if we want to stand a chance of pulling off the transformation that, we, that is needed to avoid a catastrophic outcome. Uh, you can get information on our movement or our demands and much more on our website, which will be given to you in the chat. And you can see any previous uh, Scientist Rebellion talks on our YouTube channel. So today we have roughly an hour and a half for today's presentations by four speakers. Uh, one of the speaker will be talking in Spanish with consecutive translation. Um, you can ask questions after each person, after each speaker, but the, we can also wait for a general Q&A session at the end. So you're welcome to leave your questions uh, in the chat uh, during the talk and we will call you so you can make your questions to one or several of the speakers. Today's talk is on a very interesting, interesting and important topic, actually a campaign that combines two claims in one, social and climate justice. Debt for Climate is a grassroots, uh, global South driven initiative connecting social and climate justice, justice struggles that unites labor, social and climate movements from the global so south and north for the common goal of cancelling the debt of impoverished nations as a way to pay for fossil fuels uh, to be left in the underground and financing a just transition. Today's speakers will be Sonny Morgan, uh, better known as Sonny the Solar Guy. Uh, he's a climate justice activist from South Africa and works with various organizations such as Extinction Rebellion South Africa, the Climate Justice Charter Movement and African Climate Reality Project. He is also a founder of a solar renewable energy business. Juan Pablo Olson is a specialist in economic, social, environmental, global warming and geopolitical issues and lectures on the challenges of Argentina and Latin America in the face of global warming and the World Water Crisis for the Latin American Council of Social Scientists, Sciences, or CLACSO. He is also a coordinator of the Progressive International Movement in Latin America. Luise Wagner studied environmental sociology at the University of Jena in Germany and joined the environmental justice movement in 2017. She organized with Ende Gelände on a national level and sees power in organizing across movements and borders to build connections and res on respect and solidarity. Esteban Servatz is a biotechnologist, environmental activist and founder of EcoLeaks. Esteban was born in Argentina but had to leave the country after denouncing fracking and mega mining in the state of Mendoza. He participates with the global movements Shale Must Fall and Debt for Climate. And with this introduction, I would like to hand the microphone over to the first speaker. Oh, I think that's me, Renata. I believe it's Sunny, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Sunny. Um, uh, greetings to everyone on the call. Uh, it's my great privilege uh, to speak to you today uh, from Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm not a scientist. Um, but I am an organizer. Um, I'm an organizer with various organizations and um, I want to talk to you specifically about our debt for climate campaign. So the debt for climate campaign is a grassroots movement uh, born out of collaboration with um, 
various movements from the global south um, to call on the global north to um, cancel the debt. We've been asked a number of times, what does that mean, cancel the debt? We're talking about the real financial debt that the global south owes to the IMF, the World Bank, and a number of other lenders. We want uh, to call the global north, uh, specifically the World Bank and the IMF, to cancel this, this debt. It's the debt, uh, the real debt of the global south against the climate debt that they owe, the global north owes to the global south for generations of extractivism, exploitation, um, and devastation. Uh, it's a grassroots led movement from the global south, uh, um, and we want to engage with workers on the front lines. We saw during COVID how um, rich countries in the global north behaved and basically blocked our access in the global south to uh, the vaccines. So that is just a microcosm of the behavior of the global north towards the global south. Uh, the debt in the global south in very many countries are crippling debt, odious debt, and in many cases, even um, illegal debt. Um, citizens and uh, communities were not uh, consulted when um, corrupt and unjust, and perhaps in some cases, despotic leaders took this debt uh, from the uh, uh, World Bank and the IMF. Um, in some countries, um, and I can talk for South Africa, we went through stages where the global debt was as much as 60% of our budget. Uh, so 60 cents in every 100 cents was going towards uh, payment of, uh, of debt. Um, this debt is crippling because we, stay, we live in a country where uh, unemployment is rife. Specifically, youth unemployment is, is the biggest number and the most concerning issue at the moment. Uh, that figure is as high as 62% for uh, 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 people in between the age of 18 and 35. Some of them have uh, uh, not been looking for work for over a decade because there just isn't enough work. Um, if our, in just as South Africa, as our example, if our debt were forgiven, uh, if it was uh, canceled, um, we would be able to concentrate on um, better paying jobs, um, the creation of green jobs, a Green New Deal kind of arrangement, uh, and better access to healthcare, accommodation, and uh, basic services. The country is uh, uh, drowning under cri crippling debt, not only um, in South Africa, but in the continent. In Zambia, for instance, recently, um, BlackRock refused to... Um, to renegotiate the debt of, um, of, uh, of the nation. That puts the nation into uh, a critical, almost default status. And uh, that cannot be, uh, 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 that cannot continue. Uh, places like Mozambique, Angola, they all suffer from the same, um, from the same issue. We um, believe that this campaign to cancel the debt is innovative and disruptive in the way that we can bring to bear um, power from the ground up, from worker power, worker-led power, and civil society power to call for this debt uh, because the global north has um, this uh, climate debt that it owes the global south. We, we think that this is uh, possible to do if enough um, countries, uh, uh, nations in the global north get behind it. Um, and there's something that is, uh, uh, is vital. We say that uh, communities, organizations, um, in, and formations of the global north uh, can bring power to bear against their governments and against their civil society organizations and, uh, and the powerful elite to, to make this happen. Uh, we're not asking for something uh, that is uh, not possible to do because what does the global north get in return. The Global North gets a commitment from the Global South once the debt is canceled to keep the fossil fuels in the ground. How do we do that? The money we will save from having to pay the interest on the debt will go to fund the just transition. 
in funding the just transition in the global no in the global south that simply means that the vast resources that we already have uh, fossil fuel resources will not be extracted if i use south africa as an example i give a, a climate talk to uh, to school children I, I always ask them to guess how much coal south africa has in the ground and we suffer from some, something called the resource curse if we burn coal in South Africa at the current rate, we can still burn, burn it for about 280 years. That's how much we have. Uh, so that's a resource curse. So we can make a commitment as the Global South, but countries like South Africa that have fossil fuels, gas, and coal, um, uh, and even now uh, uh, with new exploration, the, uh, oil discovery, uh, we can make the commitment to the Global North to keep that uh, fossil fuels permanently in the ground. We can do that if the debt is forgiven because then we will have financial resources um, to fund the just transition and improve the quality of life. Because one of the criticism always we'll get is, okay, if you, if you force us to keep our fossil fuels in the ground, then how does the global South develop? Well, we develop through green technologies, we develop through um, funding new innovation uh, and new forms of energy. So I think that uh, from the from from the global south, this is, in a nutshell, what the campaign is about: to ask the global north um, to cancel the debt, or well, to ask the G7 nations, particularly who control um, who control uh, the IMF and the World Bank, to cancel this debt. There are multiple examples, but I want to leave you with one figure, just to put in context the numbers between the global north and the global south. I'll just talk about a concept called value appropriation. From 1990, from 1990 to 2015, a study was recently done, released in February of this year, that said value appropriation by the Global North of the Global South for that 25 years alone, modern 25 years, contemporary time, was 242 trillion US dollars. 242 trillion US dollars. The year 2015, as a slice of that data alone, was $12 trillion. That is enough to wipe out global um, poverty 70 times over. So if you, if you wrote off all the debt in the global south, it will still be a small portion of the total commitment or the total liability of the global north climate debt. So I want to put things in perspective. So um, remind you that, that this campaign is driven by the global south, and we're asking for debt cancellation. And we do that. Um, in, by a mechanism that still has to be developed, the campaign is in, in its infancy. We're targeting a date, particularly in mind, around uh, when the G7 meets in Germany uh, in June of this year, from the 25th to the 29th, or 24th to the 28th. So the campaign is for uh, a series of global actions targeting the G7, particularly as the immediate target, but then uh, for actions to happen uh, spontaneously around the world in that week uh, in solidarity with this campaign. And the next big date after that is um, that this um, mechanism, the debt uh, cancellation mechanism, becomes a negotiating uh, tool or a negotiating strategy at COP27, either by country representatives, if we do all the hard work now, but it's a multi-year campaign, so perhaps it's more fair to say that civil society and the People's Assembly calling for the debt cancellation at uh, COP27 in Egypt will be perhaps an indication that we, we've done a good enough effort uh, at that time. So I think I'll stop at that point uh, and other speakers will fill in the blanks. Thank you very much, Sunny. That was very clear. Um, if there are any questions for Sunny at this time, I can't see any in the chat. So if there aren't, our next speaker will be Juan Pablo Olson. Juan Pablo will be speaking in Spanish. So he's going to take a rest after five minutes or less. Uh, so the translator can translate and then he will resume. Thank you very much. Over to you, Juan Pablo. Thank you very much, Renata. Uh, muchas gracias por el esfuerzo de coordinación Renata y Fabián. Muchas gracias eh, 
por el esfuerzo de traducción a Catering y les puedo hablar desde mi perspectiva de América Latina. Eh, como palabras introducción, de introductorias quiero agradecer a Sani también eh, por su introducción desde la perspectiva de, de África y para esta breve introducción para, para la traducción eh, agradecerles al grupo de científicos porque me parece que tiene, ustedes tienen un rol clave, estratégico, protagónico y heroico. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the coordination and organization efforts, Renata, Fabian, and uh, thank you so much for, uh, for the interpretation as well. Today I'm going to be talking from the perspective of Latin America. And by way of introduction, I would also like to thank uh, Sunny, who gave us his perspective from Africa, which was very interesting. And finally, just by way of a brief introduction, I would also like to thank Scientist Rebellion. Uh, I really believe that your role is key. It is strategic strategic and it is heroic. Thank you. Eh, nosotros eh, valoramos muchísimo el esfuerzo y el compromiso de un grupo de científicos que son la voz inspiradora detrás de la cual los movimientos sociales, ambientales, los movimientos sindicales nos unimos detrás de ustedes para avanzar en la profundización de la toma de conciencia que nos dirigimos tomando las palabras de Renata hacia una catástrofe ambiental y climática y por lo tanto social global. Desde ese diagnóstico que ustedes nos dan, es que nosotros presentamos esta campaña eh, que denuncia no solo la catástrofe climática, que es compartida a nivel global, sino dos aspectos que no se suelen mencionar en la denuncia global, que es además de la catástrofe climática, un modelo de colonialismo y saqueo de los recursos a los países del sur global y un proceso de endeudamiento a través de deudas financieras ilegítimas que es criminal, que en el contexto del calentamiento global, en términos de consecuencias sociales, es criminal. We greatly value the efforts of this group of uh, scientists for you are the inspirational voice through which various movements, uh, trade union movements, social movements and environmental movements can come together and form this campaign to make people aware of this environmental disaster, but which is also a social disaster and a global disaster which is impending. This is a diagnosis that you have given us and you are presenting this campaign which denounces and condemns this climate catastrophe. But it also mentions two other aspects which quite often we go without mentioning. As well as the aspects which I just mentioned, this is also a case of colonialism and pillaging from the countries of the global south. It is also a process of indebtedness. This is a financial and illegitimate debt that we are talking about. It is actually illegal and criminal. And in the context of climate change, this is even more the case and the consequences are catastrophic. Por lo tanto, este primer encuentro de diálogo entre este movimiento de deuda por clima y el grupo de científicos en rebelión nos parece estratégico, porque es humildemente sumar nuestro aporte de esfuerzos de organización, de coordinación mundial para que haya un movimiento de una doble solidaridad, una doble solidaridad, solidari eh, internacionalismo solidario para unir fuerzas a nivel global, internacionalismo solidario, y otro esfuerzo de solidaridad que es eh, solidaridad intergeneracional. Lo que hagamos ahora, de lo que hagamos ahora, depende el futuro planeta que les dejemos a las futuras generaciones. Si no hay esa doble genero generosidad, esa doble solidaridad, las futuras generaciones se van a encontrar en un escenario de catástrofe climática y de un mundo en condiciones de escasa habitabilidad en términos de la temperatura promedio del planeta, en términos de la composición del aire y en términos de lo que me parece todavía hay que profundizar, que es una muy grave crisis hídrica mundial proyectada para 2050.
And therefore, this first meeting between the Debt for Climate movement and the Scientist Rebellion uh, is strategically incredibly important. We, uh, on, a, on a humble and modest level, we believe that we can contribute through coordination and organization. And uh, we very much want to do this in order to promote two forms of solidarity, a dual solidarity, if you like. On the one hand, there is a sense of international solidarity, the idea of joining our efforts on the international stage. And there's also the idea of intergenerational solidarity for the planet that we leave our future generations very much depends on what we do now. If we do not have this sense of dual solidarity, future generations will find themselves in a situation of climate, catastrophe, climate disaster. In addition, they will also find themselves living on a planet where life is scarcely viable. And here I am talking about the temperatures, rise in temperatures, but also air quality. And indeed, uh, they will also find themselves in a situation of very serious uh, water scarcity and uh, a water catastrophe. Es por eso que compartimos con ustedes su diagnóstico, su preocupación, su compromiso. Nos ponemos a disposición de sus esfuerzos, de su lucha, en un sentido de potenciarla, de complementar su lucha y de movilizar la mayor cantidad de personas en las calles a nivel mundial, alertando, como ustedes lo vienen haciendo, de la catástrofe climática hacia la cual nos dirigimos en los próximos ocho años, y agregando a esa alerta la denuncia del saqueo de los países del sur global, de la depredación de sus recursos, y la el alerta doloroso de que si no hay una reacción global eh, va a haber consecuencias humanas de pérdida de vidas humanas en términos de un genocidio, de que las condiciones de empeoramiento del clima y de nuestras economías van a implicar eh, un acto criminal del FMI, del Banco Mundial, eh, del, del Club de París y del G7, porque ellos tienen un modelo de mundo Los grupos concentrados tienen un modelo de mundo colonial para pocos donde hay grandes mayorías sociales descartables y donde hay territorios de sacrificio, con lo cual venimos a transmitirles nuestra preocupación y nuestro compromiso de lucha. So ultimately, we very much share your concerns, your diagnosis, and also your commitment for this campaign. And we are here to, to fight, to empower uh, what you're doing, to complement uh, what you're doing, and also to mobilize as many people in the streets as possible on a global level. We want to do this whilst also alerting people to the, the climate catastrophe which is impending, which awaits us in the next eight years. And we also want to add to this a condemnation of the pillaging uh, which is going on uh, in the global south on the part of the global north. We are talking here about uh, a deprivation of resources, a stealing of resources. This is very painful. And if we do not react, if we do not act, uh, there, will, the, there will be many human consequences. And the, these consequences will result, result in a loss of human life. We could even talk about genocide here. These conditions, which will worsen uh, with regards to the climate, will actually constitute a criminal act on the part of the IMF, the World Bank, the Paris Club, and uh, indeed the G7. For the model promoted by these institutions uh, is a colonial one, uh, based on um, promoting the interests of a few at the expense of uh, a majority. And many others around the world are simply treated as cannon fodder, uh, which can be sacrificed uh, uh, with no cost. So we very much share your, your commitment and resolve. Finalmente, eh, nuevamente agradecer a Catherine por la traducción y el esfuerzo de, de coordinación. Y es, un, y, y es un honor para mí compartir con ustedes eh, este encuentro y la posibilidad de articular juntos en una sola lucha, unir nuestra fuerza en un solo músculo, en un solo puño, en una sola voz mundial que siga alertando sobre la catástrofe climática que hay que revertir y que denuncie las deudas financieras ilegítimas que el norte global le impone a los países del sur global y que también reclame por la deuda ecológica que los países del norte global tienen con el sur global. 
Así que es por eso que les envío mi profundo agradecimiento desde Argentina, un abrazo de lucha, de compromiso, de solidaridad y de construir un horizonte para nosotros, para nuestra calidad de vida y bueno, obviamente, como mencionamos al principio, para las generaciones futuras, para una solidaridad intergeneracional e internacional. Muchísimas gracias eh, de todo corazón. And finally, I would just really like to thank uh, the interpreter for her work and also uh, the coordinators of this event as well. It's a real honor for me to share this meeting um, with you. The idea here is that we come together to share the same fight, to raise our voices together, to raise our fists together, and the idea is that we come together in a united fashion. Also, this is about continuing to alert people as to the dangers of the impending climate catastrophe. It's also about denouncing and condemning the indebtedness of the global south towards the global north. And it's also about calling out the environmental debt that the global north has towards the global south. So I would sincerely like to thank each and every one of you. and. I would like to pass on my sincerest, ex my sincerest expressions of solidarity uh, and commitment. This is about building a future together and coming together. And as I mentioned before, it is also a question of um, the future generations. It's a question of international and intergenerational solidarity. Thank you. Thank you so much for both. Uh, Juan Pablo, uh, amazing words. And Catherine, you are just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> with your translation. Um, so we have a question, however, we think it's a very fundamental one. So we're going to leave it to the end so that all four speakers can have a go at it. And with that, our next speaker is going to be Luisa Wagner. Thank you so much. And also, thank you very much, Catherine, for your work. This is really a, an incredible task that you're taking on and a very important one to make international um, coordination and organization possible. So thank you so much. And also, thank you a lot for organizing this talk for everyone who was um, part of that. I am uh, calling, I'm or joining this call from Germany, which is a quite special place um, to call from when we talk about debt because maybe some of you know, maybe some of you are not aware of that, that Germany has a very special history with, history with debt and especially with debt cancellation. Um, after the second, after second World War, Germany um, had the highest government debt ratio ever recorded in history, according to a, um, a research paper that was published in 2015. So maybe it has changed until then, but until 2015, it was the, the highest, uh, it had the highest government debt ratio ever in history. And after the, the World War, the entire debt that was accumulated during the Nazi regime was cancelled. So especially Germany should have a, an awareness for what it means or what what uh, possibilities can be freed in a way with debt cancellation. In addition, to something that was called Marshall Plan, not so that was an additional, uh, additional, additional payment, call it reparation, uh, reparation payments in addition to debt cancellation, which were the preconditions for the so-called economic miracle that Germany is so proud to always identify with, you know, like the, the great Wirtschaftswunder that was based on debt cancellation um, and the, the Marshall Plan. So um, this is something that we, yeah, we want to just to highlight uh, in a way to, um, yeah, to, to make it clear what, what power that cancellation can have for a nation and that it's very easy to forget that the G7 in Germany especially was in that position once in its history and it's not very, uh, not very long ago. But of course, this campaign is not going to be a campaign for that cancellation and reparation that is going to strengthen the US uh, hegemony or perpetuating colonial exploitationist uh, extractivist project, but one that is supposed to further and enable a truly just, um, a truly just transition that is led and dictated by most affected people in most affected areas. And we want to remind people in Germany during the G7 that was mentioned before, um, of actually of the origins of their prosperity, which is not only colonialist exploitations, which Germany is barely capable of apologizing for today, um, but as I said before, on that cancellation and in, in a way of, of reparation, um, reparation payments. 
and that now it's kind of the historic moment to pay back. So during the G7, I'm, I'm co-organizing with the, uh, the G7 platform that is organizing protests around the G7 meeting that is taking place from the June 26th until June 28th. And there are going to be big demonstrations in the south of Germany where the, the, uh, the meeting is going to take place. But also there are going to be decentralized action, of course, all over, all over the world, as, as was mentioned before, but also in Germany itself. Uh, especially at key locations that remind people of the power that Germany actually has uh, when it comes to decision making processes in debt policies, because Germany is the fourth largest shareholders of the World Bank and has the, uh, the third and the fourth po most powerful voting position in all four of the key institutions of the World Bank, and this is a, a position that is similarly distributed across the, or amongst the, the G7 uh, the G7 countries, which is so important that we come together during these meetings so that we remind people, hey, we can actually uh, build pressure for those governments to actually take, uh, take responsibility uh, on this. Um, so what we're gonna do is actually, or what we are doing is uh, demanding the debt cancellations towards the G7, but we are not asking them to then tell us in a way or to then uh, guide the way towards the, tr the just transition. The just transition itself, the layout of that is going to be led by most affected people in most affected area of Global South uh, people. Um, hence this, can, this campaign, which is bringing together environmental movements, labor movements, and social movements um, across, the across the globe. And this is actually what we, we are going to show and what we are showing already, um, that we are making it very clear that the climate crisis, as Juan Pablo says, or said before, that the climate crisis is a social crisis and that debt has everything to do with both because debt is something that is used as a leverage in order to excuse the continuation of extractivism, especially in countries of the global south. Um, but if we look at the, the cuts that are being made first in order to, to pay back debt, it's, it's social spending, something that Sunny also said before that there would be money available to actually cover basic social, uh, social needs in a way. Um, and with these cuts, the first in line to be affected and primarily affected are women globally, actually. And if you look at the, the chef floor of, of predators institutions, it comes probably as no surprise that women are the first to be considered um, dis dis disposable, I think you would say, or sacrificed, you know. Um, and especially women of color, black, black women, indigenous women and working class women which is also the case for climate change in general, like women are the, are the ones to bear the costs uh, and the consequences of the climate crisis the, um, in, in first line in a way. And I see herein, I see also the responsibility of scientists and of science uh, more generally is to show and to visualize these connections. So to show the social and the political and the economic um, dimensions of climate change, because if we don't do this, we are going to allow for greenwashing, for green capitalism and for green colonialism, which is something that we don't want to. Um, and I think the climate change is the big politicizer in a way of science and a, a branch of our society that has neutrality as its basic core of the self-conception. No? So this has changed a lot because of the climate crisis. And I think this is a very important, but also a very uh, an important process, but one that is also like science has to become uh, accustomed to this new position of actually taking sides in politics as well. And this is something that we need to push and we need to push and we need to show and we need to visualize and emphasize the man-made and I emphasize the man in man-made uh, nature of the climate of the climate crisis and maybe even more so to expose the economic nature of the putrefaction that is destroying the roots of our existence. And for this, we need to come together uh, across disciplines, of course, and bring together science uh, and activism, which is something that you're already doing. So um, I, I emphasize or second what Juan Pablo is saying, of cherishing what you're doing. Um, and we, we have to become loud on the streets and in our offices as well, um, to, so that we can educate each other, you know, like uh, building this bridge between activism and, and the educational sector. Um, and so that we can build a movement of resistance that is no longer built, wait, 
based <laughs> based on uh, alienation and of domination, but on, on solidarity and respect for each other. So, if you would like to get in, if you'd like to organize actions um, around the G7, please feel free to get in touch. And of course, also beyond that, if you want to support us in our research to answer a lot of very, very important questions, um, we'd be very, very happy to welcome you in the campaign. So let us know and get in touch. And thank you for this, this opportunity to create con conversations on the topic. Thank you very much, Luisa. That was very convincing. Um, and our last speaker is going to be Esteban Servat. Over to you, Esteban. Thank you, Renata. Can you hear me okay? Okay, yeah, I'm Esteban from Argentina, as they already introduced me. Uh, thanks a lot to Renata for facilitating, to Julia and Fabian for making this happen, to also help us spread the word so that more people can find out what we are doing. And I think there is little that I can add to what already has been explained so well by my previous comrades. Um, but maybe the way I would like to present this to you is I think, you know, I have been working with grassroots movements uh, for the last few years across continents, uh, doing global actions of solidarity. And my feeling more and more is that uh, we don't have enough power alone. XR, SR, Endegelende, Fridays of Future, we don't have enough, we don't need, we don't have the required power that we need to exert the necessary force and pressure on the politicians and companies to stop the killing. And more and more, I'm coming to realize that we need the worker unions. I think this is a no brainer. Uh, I think most people here would agree that and I'm not the first one to say it. But I think that most people don't have a clue how to truly get them on board at a large enough scale on time. And the reason is or one reason is that labor unions, whether it be in the global south or north, they're very much focused on more uh, urgent survival needs, such as food, jobs, education, healthcare, and so on. And it's difficult, not everyone gets the climate crisis as scientists do, as other, as activists do, as, uh, as, as Fridays for Future does. So what we may have found is, is a way, it's not, not the only way, but a way to speak to the labor unions in a language that they understand that really touches a neuralgic point to them. Labor unions starting in the global south, they don't really, you know, I'm, I'm speaking generically, but in general, you come to them about the climate crisis, maybe they will support what you're saying, but that's a, a long way away from mobilizing tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people on the streets or paralyzing an economy with a general strike for this purpose. But when you talk to them about the debt, the debt is a neurologic topic. The debt is right there next to food, next to jobs, next to education on their top priorities. I think Sonny was saying, and he always says, I don't remember he said it this time, but uh, you know, for every dollar that uh, South Africa makes, or I could say the same about Argentina, nearly 50% or so goes to pay back the interest of the debt. So that's money that cannot be used for social services, for feeding the people, for creating jobs, and so on. So it's a very clear burden. And by connecting debt and climate, we are building a bridge of an unprecedented level globally to connect social justice fights and organizations such as labor unions with climate justice movements such as the ones we have in Europe. So the, the combination of these two things is not only unprecedented at this kind of level, but it, it couldn't be more urgently needed. Because if we can continue building this bridge and turn for, from a few thousands of people everywhere to eventually reaching millions on the streets, millions on the streets is what can make possible the impossible. We know that debt for climate, canceling all the debts of the global south, today to many of you will sound like an impossible, like an illusion. But we also know that anything impossible becomes possible when we're millions on the streets. And that's what we are working on. Finding that formula is not a theory, it's not a book, it's on the streets and it's pragmatic. And that's what we are doing and it's going, it's going very well. You can see we have the CTA from Argentina, one of the top 
uh, three or four labor organizations of the country with the capacity to mobilize tens of thousands of people sharing um, uh, calls with XR and other activist groups. And you see they don't normally belong together. They have never shared spaces together and they are coming together at the same table because they have a common goal, which is called debt for climate. So I, I am very excited about this campaign. We've been doing a lot of different campaigns against fracking, gas for water and so on with many of you as well. And by far, I feel this is the most powerful and, and exciting campaign that I have ever been a part of because it's connecting social justice and climate justice because it brings us back to the organizational capacity and the mobilization capacity of the labor movements, which are another level from what we are able to do as climate activists. So I think the combination of all of these forces coming together behind a common cause will be unstoppable and we want to invite you and we want to come together with everyone we need scientists you can do a lot of help because all of these ideas or a lot of these ideas need to be grounded more and more into hard numbers and there is so much research to do there are so many papers and, and analysis to read and every scientist even if you're not an economist or you don't come from that kind of field we need and we can use the help of all of you so I'm really happy that you organized this to help us spread the word. I would like to add to ask you also, Scarlett has been sharing our social media. And as you will see, we're just starting with the social media and none of us has capacity to take care of them because we're all volunteering our time. We have no kinds of resources. So if you could help us by even by following the Twitter account and so on, it would already be massive help. So thank you very much and great to be here. Thank you very much, Esteban. It all makes a lot of sense to me, but I'm not an economist. And uh, we have two questions. Uh, one is by, I'm not sure how I, I'll pronounce this right, Kik. Uh, would you like to formulate the question? Yeah, I'm a bit surprised. I'm, it's Gia. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, but I, every time I say, as, we, as long as we use monetary means itself, uh, all companies, but especially the biggest 500 companies, respective uh, banks and financial institu institutes behind, with this system, with this competition, nobody can act because nobody can give up their monetary uh, competitiveness. And with this, everybody has to generate finances in this global situation. And it's not a, the correct, for me, it's not a correct focus to, to focus on debt. It's now the world financial system. As long as this is active, nothing is possible for nobody. And there's no fight possible, except of, I wrote it in the chat, except of maybe a third world war now in this situation. But what is possible now, what we have to recognize is we have a new organizational instrument in humankind for humankind. And this is the global network. And this could be prepared in a way that it replaces the monetary system in, in one fell swoop. And in, in, in one moment, let's say in a, in a special date, specific date. And this would free ourselves, the whole world, not only the poor countries, also the rich countries in, in a way that we can fight against climate catastrophe. And how do you see those two main issues uh, uh, as, a, as, as, a, as, as a group? Who would like to have a go at this question? I can do it. I can do it unless anyone else wants to. Okay, I, I can go. Uh, the rest yeah, can. If you, Esteban, you go. If there's any gaps, then I'll pull it in. Well, um, Jaya, I don't know where you're from, uh, but Sunny was earlier responding to your message with a very South Africa based perspective. And uh, we sometimes get some kind of questions that say, unless you're overthrowing the system, nothing that you do helps. Unless you are going to give the magic formula to replace the monetary system or capitalism, rather do nothing. And that's exactly the kind of question and the kind of attitude that makes people feel powerless and useless and renders them completely inactive and, and burns them out of activism. We are building a global movement to empower people like you 
people in the global north as well as the people in the global south to take action and change the world and change the system. You know how, unless you have uh, a solution, how you plan to replace the mon monetary system, maybe you can make a panel with Scientist Rebellion, I would love to attend. Uh, but if you don't have a better answer, if you don't have an answer, you know, what we are trying to do is we have found a weak link in the system where we can hit it together and gain a victory. And when you gain a victory, you can get into the system and start breaking it further down and build a movement that will make these victories happen. What kind of movement do you think you need to bring down capitalism? What kind of movement do you think we need to bring down the monetary system, which I completely agree with you, but first you need to build a movement and the movement will not just come out of a magic battle. It will not just come out of um, somewhere. It needs to be built step by step. It's a process. And right now we're failing. We have great initiatives. We have Scientist Rebellion, XR, Fridays for Future, Ende Gelende, but we're falling short of the huge goal, the huge challenge that we have that is urgent, which is what you're pointing out. How is XR and Scientist Rebellion and Fridays for Future going to replace the monetary system? I think you will agree with me that not, not yet. So we need in the process to build a movement that can actually break down this system piece by piece. And what we have found is a weak link in the chain by claiming the climate debt of the global north to cancel the debts of the global south to take climate action. Of course, it's not the solution to all of the problems of the monetary system or capitalism, but it is one powerful and unprecedented scale in the right direction. So that's what we are doing. And it's very much focused on our, our perspectives of the global south. You know what I was saying that Sunny replied to you from a perspective of people having hunger and dying and not having hospitals and stuff like this. So for people in the global south, these things are very pragmatic, very practical. Uh, they don't care so much about the perfect formula and the perfect idea to take action. We take action. Then we develop the philosophies and the ideas as we go, because we have the urgency to act, to survive. That was very convincing for me, Esteban. <laughs> Would everybody, anybody else uh, like to add to Esteban's arguments? No, Esteban, um, uh, very succinct. But what I wanted to add is, uh, is that the objective of the debt cancellation is very real and is very achievable in the time frame that we have for urgent climate action. We, uh, we, we keep on saying that the IPCC's report talks about, and they keep on revising the number nearer and nearer and nearer to say that 10 years, 20 years, whatever time frame we have, 1.5 is slipping away. Um, and so, so, so to get climate action, as urgent as possible. This is probably the most innovative campaign um, around on the planet at the moment uh, to drive home this idea of urgency. And at the same time to uh, uh, deal a blow as uh, uh, the previous uh, uh, the person who posed the question uh, is to attack the system, but we're not gonna attack that system uh, uh, in the same time frame that we need to achieve 1.5. Uh, there are areas in the global south that scientists have already told us, uh, and people who uh, scientists on the call who work in climate will uh, recognize the name uh, Professor Bob Scholes, uh, posthumously uh, uh, submitted a paper that said that in South Africa alone and, and our neighbors will suffer double the global average. So we'll suffer the effects of 3%, of 3 degrees. So this is very, very urgent and it's existential, not just in some esoteric kind of way, but it's existential today. In a rain bomb a month ago, 550 people died uh, 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 in South Africa. And it's that kind of effect we're going to be seeing more often. So it's quite urgent. And, and, and this idea of changing the monetary system, while noble and all of that, is just not going to get us there in time. Thank you, Sonny. Uh, I just want to comment that uh, Catherine, our translator, is going to be with us until the end of the the event. So if in case Juan Pablo wanted to uh, make any comments, uh, Juan Pablo, you've got your translator ready. Yeah. Yes, Renata, please. I would like to answer a little bit from Jaya uh, in, in Spanish, if you don't care. 
Eh, no, agradecerle a Llega su comentario porque abre una perspectiva de, de una opinión presente en la opinión pública y todo para nosotros es eh, una, una batalla, un esfuerzo por instalar en la opinión pública eh, una idea fuerza, una campaña, como los científicos hablan de romper la posición conservadora del negacionismo científico. Todavía hoy existe en muchos sectores de la sociedad la visión de Donald Trump de que el calentamiento global es una mentira. Con lo cual tenemos muchos puntos de opinión o mucho sentido común instalado por la industria del negacionismo que tiene por detrás millones de dólares con la cual hay que confrontar y ustedes fueron los primeros en, en confrontar con la visión del negacionismo científico. Entonces, lo que dice Shea nos obliga a nosotros a realmente hacer un gran esfuerzo para enfrentar eh, el sentido común que instala el Fondo Monetario, que es que su sistema no puede ser cambiado. Yes, thank you very much. I would just really like to thank Ojea for his comment, because it's a comment which actually is very much present in uh, public opinion at the moment. It's very much present in our society. And this is indeed a battle. It's a fight that we are waging in order to um, inculcate the idea of our campaign. We want to break this conservative view uh, relating to climate denial. Donald Trump's view that climate change is uh, a myth is actually very much still present in our society. Uh, in many sectors of our society. So there are actually many views, uh, there is much uh, conventional wisdom, if you like, uh, which is born out of this industry of denial and this industry of climate change denial has millions of dollars behind it. So we need to really uh, break this, we need to uh, come together and make an enormous effort to do precisely the opposite and inculcate, inculcate the opposite idea. Thank you. Y les comparto la perspectiva de Argentina. Argentina es el ejemplo de cómo el FMI puede estafar en un modus operandi criminal a un país entero con una complicidad entre los funcionarios del fondo y el presidente anterior de la Argentina en una estafa de 44 mil millones de dólares que fue la deuda contraída por Argentina que en su totalidad se destinó a la fuga. Eso es un crimen del FMI y para nosotros no hay una posibilidad de aceptar esa estafa y es por eso que hay grandes movilizaciones en Argentina para luchar contra eh, esa, esa conspiración del FMI que tiene un modus operandi no solo para la Argentina, no solo para la Argentina y que en el contexto del calentamiento global es criminal, es, es algo criminal. Un país que no va a tener recursos en los próximos ocho años para enfrentar la crisis climática y que tiene el 50% de su población debajo de la línea de la pobreza, bajo ningún punto de vista podemos aceptar que esa es la situación que no se puede modificar, porque dependen vidas humanas de esta problemática que Shea mencionó. Entonces, ese es el debate profundo que queremos dar. And I completely share the perspective of Argentina here. Argentina is a very telling example of the fraud uh, carried out by the IMF against this particular country. And it's also an example of uh, complicity between uh, functionaries and civil servants of the IMF and a former president of our country. They were basically in league together. And Argentina ended up with a debt of $44 billion. And we did not see head or tail of this money. This was actually a crime committed by the IMF. And for us, we simply cannot accept this state of affairs which is why we are trying to mobilize as many people as possible in order to fight against um, this complicity uh, on the part of the IMF and their modus operandi. This is not just the case in Argentina, but it is completely criminal. And I really want to emphasize the fact that this is a crime. The, in eight years, our country will simply not have the resources necessary to fight climate change and actually 50% of our population live below the poverty line. So we simply cannot accept the status quo and we cannot allow the situation to go unchanged. Human lives are at stake here, so we really need to act. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you. I think uh, we're going to move on to a different question. 
Um, I saw Miran had a question. Miran, would you like to formulate the question yourself? Uh, yeah. Yeah. or so-called yeah. reviewer too i can i can i can read my question you know like i just what i wrote here so uh, i mean the question is what happens when there is no response from the global north to these initiatives because um you know the global north countries will ignore this call to cancel the debt um, <laughs> um i do not see how given the political situation in the global north that can happen um and Specifically, um, um, you know, uh, rather than suggesting anything abstract, um, you know, are there plans to redirect the organizing um, or to channel some of it towards projects that already happen or towards ideas that you know need to take place that don't wait for the global north to be nice, such as solidarity economy, food sovereignty initiatives like Via Campesina or reviving some of the uh, larger scale political projects from the past, such as, um, you know, actually repudiate the debt and, uh, you know, make national economies more self-sufficient or uh, de-link from the global north and, and, and uh, you know, uh, start creating a, a, a more just international economy with what we have. Um, so that, that's the question. I can, yes. I can yes. Yeah, thank you for the question. And obviously, we all know, as I said earlier, that it looks like an impossible now, and we will only make the impossible possible by turning out millions on the streets. And this will take time. But this is not a one and one date campaign. It's not ending at the G7 meeting in, in, in Germany in June. It's, it's, it's starting. It's giving birth to the movement then on the streets. And we will only grow it going forward. Keep in mind that the bridge, the true bridge between labor unions and climate movements has not happened. And we are talking about nothing less than that, of building that capacity. And it's not only the, the global south labor unions, but the global north as well. Think of Greece, Portugal, uh, Spain, uh, Romania, the most indebted countries even in Europe. The, the labor unions will also see the potential of this. And unlike uh, mobilizations of the past, blockades of the past, demos, Fridays uh, of the past, this has a lot more power, a lot more flesh, because it's bringing together a, a, a breath of groups that have never been together before. So we are not, if we were of that thinking, uh, same as the question with the monetary system, we wouldn't even start. We would get, we would stay home because we think that no one will do anything. So we have no power, then why, 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 why bother to do this? But we very much believe and are convinced that what we are building is unprecedented and it will be very powerful. It's true that the global north governments don't want to do this, but that's why we will hit them at their homes. We will hit them at the, in the G7 meetings in Paris, in Brussels, in the IMF headquarters in uh, Washington, D.C., and so on. And that's why it's so important to come together between global north and global south activists, because in the global south, we're usually invisible. We have mobilizations of tens of thousands of people or hundreds of thousands that go completely unseen. But this time you're going to see them because they're going to be amplified and visibilized by the counterparts in the global north. And I hope to count you among those people that will be supporting us, if nothing else, on social media, because otherwise, yes, nothing will get done if we only think that nothing will get done. Can I jump in, Renato? Go for it. Thank you. So I think it's the, the questions for me show at least two things. One is the, the last speaker said, um, oh, why go for something as abstract abstract than that? Why not go for something more concrete? Sunny just said it before. I think it was Sunny. Like that, and, and you wrote it in the chat as well. That is not something abstract. It is something that is very concrete and that has very concrete consequences for people on the ground. It is very abstract for people who are privileged and who are not um, at the front lines of what happens when that um, is biting you in the neck, if you want. Um, and it shows me a second, it, the, the nature of the two questions and also the way it was, um, the way the reaction to it maybe is something 
or it shows me the importance of these kinds of gatherings and something that we really need to work on, uh, maybe also men need to work on, is the ability to listen while someone is replying and answering to what you have asked, listen to what is what is being said, what is being replied to, otherwise it's not a question, otherwise it's just the need to communicate and to criticize, then just formulate it as a comment and not as a question. So listen, listen to what Sonny said before in terms of what, <clears throat> how concrete that is for people in the global south. And maybe to be, become more concrete <laughs> on what you, you asked, and not just comment on what I, I what I want to, um, because you said, what are you going to do if the global north is not reacting? Well, you, you, you don't need to ask the question because in the global north is reacting already, first one. Second one, nobody's waiting on the global north to react. Global south is going and global north is joining. And a lot of people are from global north especially are joining this campaign because they see the big potential, because there is a great hunger for solidarity actions. Actually, in the past, we've seen uh, from my experience in organizing international actions that were on a very like a lower level of complexity, if you want not abstraction, but complexity. Um, the, the reaction from global north countries was, wow, this actually, this feeling of being together on the streets together with, I don't know, 20 more countries, I think up to now we are 30, 25, I don't know. Um, we've organized with less. And the reaction was like, wow, this is the first time um, that what, this was the thing that got us out of our, of our despair. This is something that will give us hope. So this is for just for the climate movements, a very good reason that they are going to join. And not only for the, the abstract solidarity for the so-called global south, but because that is something that is strangling people in the global north as well. And it's something if you talk to people, it's not, it's not abstract. That is what defines the end of your month. And if you're just strangled in that, you are not going to go to organize any revolutionary, ever, ever, any revolution of the monetary system because you're just uh, occupied with paying back your fucking debt, <laughs> pardon my French. Um, and this is the same thing for the debt cancellation of countries of the global south, as was said in the in the talk before. People don't have capacities, they don't have life, they don't have a breath left, they have not have a drop of water left in order to come to your revolution and make the monetary system fail because that is strangling them. There's just no time for it and there's no life left in people in order to come out for this. So that is something very concrete to cancel to from the for the first step free the forces that you need in order to walk the walk of the revolutionary of the revolutionary overthrow of the monetary system but for that you need the people you need the people in the global south you need the people that are most affected by this monetary system which is not people in germany or privileged people in germany who are sitting in their reading circles that's just a fact so this campaign is all about freeing resources for the people to actually engage in a in a transition that is dictated by the people who are most affected by the system that you want to overthrow thank you Thank you, Luisa. Would anybody else? Oh, Stefan. No, I was just applauding Luis. <laughs> oh, I see. Um, anybody else? Yeah, if not, we're going to move on to the next question. We had a question so, by sorry, our comment. Sorry, Renata, can I? Oh, can okay, I go for it. Of course. Okay. Just, just for us, some. Uh, ideas for from the global south in, in spanish if you don't care um, est, estas eh, comentarios que, que aportó luis también me, me resuenan a mí a aportarles un poco de perspectiva del sur global eh, de por qué la campaña nace en el sur global desde lo profundo de la historia del sur global eh, es lo que dice luis para nosotros es una obligación dar esta pelea por supervivencia, no es una cuestión de ideas, es una necesidad para nuestra supervivencia. Ustedes como científicos saben que la problemática del calentamiento global proviene de la época de la revolución industrial, eso es sabido por todos. Desde la perspectiva del sur global, el sistema actual capitalista, racista y patriarcal nació depredando a América Latina y África en genocidios de genocidios y masacres fundacionales del actual sistema que algunos sectores de la población los mantienen en una zona de confort y privilegio, pero para nosotros es una cuestión de supervivencia. Es realmente una cuestión de supervivencia. El actual sistema nació con, la, con la, el genocidio de 10 millones de habitantes de pueblos originarios en América y 12 millones de esclavizados. 
nació para nuestra perspectiva del sur global en genocidios eh, sobre los cuales se montó un sistema de saqueo y depredación de nuestro territorio. E esa es nuestra perspectiva. Y decir que no se puede cambiar ese sistema es como decir que en la época de la esclavitud o del saqueo de América eran sistemas que no, no se podían cambiar. Es una discusión profunda que se abre en este en esta momento. Solo para agregar lo que dijo Luis, muchas gracias. Yes, thank you. And I was going to say that Louise's comments really resonate uh, for me, especially as this is the perspective of uh, the Global South, and this is why the campaign was born out of the Global South. For us, it is a real obligation to wage this battle because, it, because it's a question of our survival. These questions are not just ideas for us. This is actually a necessity for the sake of our own survival. You as scientists know, for example, that climate change uh, came and originated from uh, the Industrial Revolution. Everyone knows this. And the Global South's perspective is that this current system, which is racist and patriarchal and colonialist, was actually born out of various genocides which took place in Latin America and Africa. In fact, these massacres, these genocides, uh, paved the way for the current system that we are now seeing. And indeed, some sectors are maintained in a situation of privilege. However, for us, our survival is at stake. So for us, this really is a question of survival. The current system was actually born out of the massacres of 10 million indigenous peoples in the Americas. And it was also born out of the enslavement of 12 million people. So this current system, as I said, was simply born out of genocide, but also out of the pillaging of our own territories. That's our perspective. And saying that we can't change the current system is also like saying, like it, like it would have been the equivalent, for example, of saying back then that we couldn't change the system of slavery. So that's my perspective. And I just wanted to uh, add a little bit to what Louisa was saying. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you for both, to both of you. Um, we've got a question or a comment from Tara Tara Vamos. If I got it correct. Uh, Tara, would you like to? Yeah, sure. Um, I I think that I got I like just thinking about stuff and hearing other people's answers. I I just feel like actually that for people in the United States anyway, equivoc like drawing an equivalence between what's happened in countries in the global south and what's happened with individuals and in debt in the united states might be an equivalency that makes people kind of understand a little bit what's happening because people in the u.s have taken out debt for medical stuff for uh education for housing that you know like that does have that sort of crushing every day I was, I was just trying, my question was basically like how to frame explaining this to people that don't have much awareness of debt on the global scale. So if anyone has a, has a great framework that they want to propose, I'm, I'm like, there's a lot of people in the U.S. that don't know a lot about what's going on internationally with anything. Can, can I take a step? Uh, at the answer, and and the answer is, is an indirect answer, in the sense that myself and Esteban had a Sunday afternoon discussion a few, maybe a maybe more than a month or two ago, and we asked ourselves where can this campaign go? What is the potential of a campaign like this? And we played a thought experiment. And one of the ideas that came up and said, we need to make the debt for climate uh, action relevant and pertinent and perhaps even successful. But even if we win small gains, imagine if down the line, we can tie this campaign to colonial reparations, to loss and damage, but also to the lived experiences of people on the ground and the United States of America came up in the conversation because we know that there's more than a trillion dollars in student debt alone. 
So if we can, if we get our narrative correct, if we start speaking um, and getting traction, getting the labor movements behind it, getting the workers behind it, then it will be a short skip to be able to tie debt forgiveness, cancellation of debt for, 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 for individuals and for small businesses around the world. But we have to start somewhere. When we talk about the chink in the armor or, 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 or the weak link, we've identified climate debt as that, uh, as that uh, entry point. But the conversation going forward can easily be made to be able to say, well, then this is a add on or is a natural progression of this debt forgiveness, debt cancellation to begin to draw in uh, the universities and the marginalized communities around the world. But our entry point at the moment is climate debt, but we can have this conversation because that kind of uh, a conclusion that the speaker just raised, how do we tie to, to to, to the story in the United States, because debt cancellation might seem, debt cancellation for climate might seem uh, 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 quite a stretch, but, 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 but behind that and the underpinnings of that is the change of the system. Um, and the change of the system, it's easy to make that connection about canceling individual debt, canceling this burden of one trillion student debt. I'm sure it's trillions more in other sectors, but I'm just thinking, I just took a chink, I just took a leaf out of, the current debt and, 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 and to focus on student debt in particular. Thank you. Thank you, Sonny. Uh, so we've got two more questions we're going to take. Uh, the first one is from Sarah Greenwood, Greenwald. Sarah? Uh, hello. I just was thinking strategically, um, and I don't know very much about it at all, I have to apologize, that um, uh, strong financial forces in the global south uh, it, it might benefit from the cancellation of the debt. Now, of course, strong economic forces may, uh, you know, they, they, you, mean, you can't always be sure you can trust them, right? But um, possibly uh, they could be useful, and I wondered if that had been considered. I can answer that if no one else wants to. Um, hi, Sarah. So basically, we are targeting the public debt. Not we are obviously not calling for the cancellation of corporate debt. That is a, a totally different monster, and often used for greed we are targeting the cancellation of the debt that is a burden for the people. And in the process, we are working on politicizing those people. One thing that maybe ties to the previous questions as well is that, um, look, the climate discussion in Europe is mostly held by a small group of well-meaning intellectual white people. And around the world is not very different. And the people that have, you know, the millions, if not billions of people whose fate depends on what will happen with the climate actions are not yet sitting at the table. They are the biggest stakeholder of this. And they're not sitting at the table. They don't have a say because, first of all, they, they don't have the knowledge and they don't have the power. What this campaign is doing is to begin to bring those people to the table by expanding out of the bubble of the climate movement into labor forces, into social justice, social movements, politicize them into the climate fight early on before it's too late. And likewise, politicize the climate movement, let's say of Europe or the global North towards social causes, toward debt, toward the financial system that may enable us to build that movement that would eventually allow us to tackle the system at large, the monetary system and so on. So to answer your question in the, in the short version is, um, we are not tackling corporate debt. We are tackling the, the cancellation of the public, the foreign debt of the countries that is mostly illegitimate. We are calling for the cancellation of the illegitimate debts and supporting that kind of struggle. And I think Sunny also wants to reply. If I may um, clarify, I was just thinking of the great uh, benefit to the entire economy, uh, someone mentioned 
uh, of any country that's currently burdened by debt. When that burden is relieved, somebody's going to benefit. That was my only thought. And now so, uh, uh, Sarah, I wanted to answer it directly because that strong economic force, uh, social economic force, does exist. Uh, and it's what we have identified as the worker formations. Because in the Global South, the worker formations is the economic force. Um, I, 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 uh, in our weekly meetings, and uh, we have a philosophical discussion, and we resort to some poetry. And one of the things I said is that we've forgotten that we, um, we are like a dragon that has forgotten that it can spew fire. Um, and that's the, the bottom line, is the worker formations have not yet fully flexed its muscles or exercised its courage uh, yet. And, uh, and they are the economic force that you, that you speak about. If you ask which financial or economic force can be unleashed to get the, the biggest benefit from debt cancellation, it will be the worker formations because it will re, uh, lead to a number of things. One, it will lead to increased wages, less unemployment and more job creation. These are the things that neo-colonialists and neoliberalists always ask for. Where, where's the jobs going to come from? Where's the growth going to come from? It's going to come. We're going to use the same language against them. It's going to come from empowering workers. Thank you Thank very you. much to both of you. Thanks for your climate poetry, Sunny. I love it. Also, Esteban, your comment about breaking out of the climate bubble, I think is very, very real. Um, so the last question or comment is from Jana. Yes, hello. Um, I also have to admit that I'm not so much in the topic and maybe I just missed the point or <laughs> I don't know. But um, especially if the, if the goal is, and I, I do totally un agree and understand that uh, the unions are crucial, but I, 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 I'm just um, struggling to frame it in a way that it would be interesting for you. I mean, I guess we all see the point and we all think it's an amazing campaign, but how do we, how do we sell it now that it goes beyond our bubble? Thank you. Uh, uh, Jana, um, I think it was you who asked the question. I sent you a private response because the literal interpretation is to say when there's two people at a negotiation, the one's making the demand and the other one is likely to ask, well, what's in it for me? And that is the number of the argument, right? What's in it for the global north? What's in it for the global north is besides the fact that it meets its obligation to pay its climate debt. So morally, that's, that, that we can make another case for that. But what's in it for them is that we keep the fossil fuels in the ground. The counterbalance of this argument to, um, to cancel the debt is that in the end, the message to the global north and to uh, the IMF and to the World Bank and to the governments and to uh, the big global NGOs and civil society in the global north is that they get the one thing that they actually demand at every uh, climate meeting, at every climate uh, negotiation is for the global south to keep the fossil fuels in the ground. So as a negotiator, uh, that would be that would be the payback, and that would be that would be what I would be offering um, in return for 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 the cancellation, uh, notwithstanding the moral obligations, notwithstanding the historical debt. Here is a negotiation done uh, uh, with a give and take. So uh, so, yeah, uh, it's this promise to keep the fossil fuels in the ground. Uh, um, that's the big selling point, I think. Um, we haven't perfected the mechanism. The mechanism is decentralized because whilst the call is global, while the call is global and uniform, the demand is uniform, uh, there might be um, uh, uh, negotiations taking place at regional levels. So the give and take might be, from a negotiating point, slightly different for everyone, for, for all the negotiators around the table. There might be private deals that will be, that will be struck between countries and their uh, creditors, uh, but, but, but in the end, it's to keep the fossil fuels in the ground. And there's no, there's no perfect formula, there's no perfect mechanism. Because of the infancy and the newness of the campaign, uh, we have people working on the mechanism itself uh, and the data behind the mechanism. But on, at face value, that's the trade-off. Uh, cancel the debt and we keep the fossil fuels in the ground. 
And if I may quickly add to what Sunny was just saying for Yana, um, imagine from the perspective of the global north, the movements realize that the opportunity to reach the, to keep the 1.5 degree target is slipping through our fingers. Nothing is being done at large enough scale quickly enough. And this could potentially leave trillions of dollars of fossil fuels in the ground with a stroke of a pen. If only we were enough people coming together all over the world. And with that said, that also, you know, we are going to, yes, keep the fossil fuels in the ground for debt cancellation, but we're also pushing and supporting all the demands for the illegitimate debts need to be canceled at the exchange of nothing. You know, there's a lot of the debt that is illegal, that was awarded illegitimately, that needs to be canceled for nothing. There is also loss and damage that needs to be paid. There's also reparations that we are supporting. All of this is part of the campaign, but what is in, what's in it for the Global North that can actually, what you're saying, how do we pitch it? How do we sell it? Well, you can tell them this, this can achieve an unprecedented victory for the climate movement globally by leaving trillions of dollars of fossil fuels in the ground with a stroke of a pen that could happen soon if only we were quick enough to build the necessary power on the streets. And if I may jump in um, quickly, uh, I think there's someone, something else also that is in for the so-called Global North, if you, because your question in the chat, if I saw it correctly, was also the question like, okay, what, what about the, the labor movements in the Global North? Well, they are, at the moment, they're so powerless. And we can see that they're disorganized. Uh, in the case of Germany, at least, their demands that 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 come from labor unions are uh, they are very important. But they are like for what labor unions were uh, empowered to do in the in the past to really organize revolutions in the streets. Now the demands are so low. Like we we need to step up our game in a way. And what can be learned, or what is in it for the global north in this in this term as well? Labor, labor unions in global south countries, for example, in Argentina, they can they are really really strong. Like Esteban, I think said, uh, they they mobilize millions in the streets. So what is in it for the global north for labor unions is to become powerful again, to also to um, uh, to live through internationalism again. I know we had the first, second, third, fourth. I don't know at which state we're in with the uh, international labor labor force, so to say. But to come back to this self-esteem in a way, like the, the labor laborers workers are the ones who are keeping the system running. But for now we don't we are fucking powerless because also of the 19 after the 1950s, labor unions were pretty much betrayed by the by the uh, the contract that they um, signed in a way with, with governments, with companies and so on. But we haven't since then, we haven't evolved in a way. So in this campaign, you can they can come together with unions that are still powerful to to regain the power to reclaim the power that they once had. I, I was once part of a, a discussion um, where they the, the panel organizers, they invited someone in Germany as well from a, a, a union. I don't remember which one, but basically one that that is part of the car industry in Germany. And I asked him the question, like what like the, the entire union movement in Germany is really nationalist. Sorry to say it, but it's really like we have to keep our jobs. We have to like German, 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 German and German cars. So of course, it's a specific case study, I think. But I asked him also, like, what about the international perspective of it? You know, like you're securing the, the jobs that you are trying to secure in Germany that are related to coal, that are related to the car industry. They are the cause of death for a lot of people in other countries. Like, what about this international um, sense of connection that used to be there in the labor unions? And he just said, like, I wish we were there, but just the awareness of it isn't there yet. So this is something that, that, we, can, that we, we can push for and that we can uh, offer to labor unions all over the world to just build this international solidarity again. And also then to bridge labor unions with the climate movement, because <clears throat> uh, speaking of repair, I think the climate movement has done some damage because it also is not aware of the power that it actually has. It ha I think we're really not at the level where we could be. Coming from Ende Gelände, uh, usually it used to be in Germany. It used to be the, the leading coal anti-coal movement. Now becoming the anti-gas movement. Um, I think a big mistake or tactical mistake that we we made was to. It's easiest to hit at the extraction side of extractivism, right? But that's also the side where the workers are. 
So we created a, a, a conflict in a way because we needed the we needed this drastic picture of the big coal mine with a, with some teeny tiny people in it blocking coal diggers and stuff. But we created some some conflicts with labor unions there as well. So it's it's really tough for climate movements to come together with labor unions because it seems like we are on different ends, but we are really we are actually not. And this just transition that includes uh, climate movements, environmental justice movements, and labor unions really is at the core, this connection is at the core for a just transition that is not just securing jobs, necessary money or resources in a way for German workers as well, but also connecting to lives uh, in global southern countries, while at the same time recognizing the emergency of the climate of the climate crisis. So that is, I, I would say that we have to, that we have to offer for the, for the global north as well, to hit also, to hit at, at points that were not the workers at the far, at the front line of the activism, but actually the 1%, you know, like, and if you're hitting the IMF and the World Bank, you're not just hitting that, you are hitting a financial system that is based on colonialism. If you look at who's at the, on the chief, uh, in the chief chairs of, of the, World Bank and the IMF, it's, it's only Europe and the US, basically. And you also have Japan and China in some cases, but this is what this is what is at stake, you know, and I think this is something that, yeah, that the campaign has to offer for both, both so South and North for uh, MAPA and uh, white European people in general. Okay, I'm really sorry to have to um, call for an end because we've come to the time limit. Um, I think it's been extremely enriching discussion and talks. Um, I think we've all learned a lot and um, become very interested in taking part of the campaign. Um, hopefully, um, further down the line, we'll have, we will have the chance of having you again. Um, but for now, we are thanking all of the speakers. Uh, great thanks to the translator, Catherine, and to all of uh, you um, who have come to the talks to listen to the speakers. Uh, great thanks, and we will see you at the next talk. Please uh, stay in touch with us. Uh, this is an ongoing uh, talk series, so there will be more talks in the future. You will also be able to see the recording in our YouTube channel. So please stay in touch. Thanks to all of you and have a great day. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Invite. See you Take on the care. street. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Catherine. Gracias a ti también. <laughs> Adios. Thank you, Catherine. That was amazing. No worries. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Bye.